the first moment in what is going to become such a defining part of Southern life. If you ask people from the South or people from other sections about the importance of football to the South, almost all of them will say college football is tremendously important to Southerners. Therefore, if you start from the premise that football is important in defining who we are as a people and our sense of mastery over other regions of the United States, and we take inordinate pride in football in the 1950s, 1960s, 1970s, and after, then you have to ask yourself, when did this begin? What triggered it? What magical moment was there that defines the South and causes it to begin to think of itself in these terms. That is our athletic prowess versus your eggheadism. And that moment is 1925. The 1926 Rose Bowl was without a doubt the most important game before or since in Southern football history. Football is a game of the future in college life. Players will be forced to live a most ascetic life on a diet of rare beef and pork for additional courage and fortitude. Bill Little, Alabama captain, 1892. It wasn't much of a contest. The Alabama Crimsons won their first official game 56 to nothing. Their opponent, a team made up of high school players from Birmingham. The students on that first team, and nearly every team until World War I, were from the elite families of Alabama, society's brightest and wealthiest. The first roster included a future Speaker of the House of Representatives, fullback Will Bankhead, and a two-term governor, reserve Bib Graves. The most dominant Southern team of the 1890s was the Sewanee, Tennessee Mountain Tigers. In a play for national attention, Sewanee went on the road and beat five major Southern teams in six days. But there would be little respect given the pioneer Southern powerhouses. Teams like Vanderbilt, Georgia Tech, or Auburn could win every game, but could only gain national respect by going north. So north they went. An ambitious Virginia team arranged the first challenge and traveled to Princeton. They lost 116 to nothing. So Southern teams would go north on what was invariably hailed as northern invasions in the Southern newspapers. They would invariably lose the game, and then they would come home to hosannas and much praise for defending the honor of the Southland. The South did develop its share of intense rivalries. Alabama and Auburn had played nearly every year in a battle for statewide bragging rights. But the classic turned bitter in 1908. Incredible bickering over contract issues led to the dissolution of the matchup. The two teams would not play again for 40 years. In 1912, the first great Alabama star, Bully Vandegraaff, earned All-American honors, highly unusual for a Southern athlete. It was also the year Alabama recruited the Virginian, who for the next 25 years would have the most influence of anyone on the development of Alabama football. The recruit was the school's new president, 42-year-old George Denny. Dr. George Denny was a visionary who saw what sports could do for a university. He realized that winning football teams could make people interested in your university and bring the alumni back, get donations from the alumni, and he proceeded. He was. You know, he was pretty much a dictator-type guy, and, and I don't mean that in a derogatory way. I mean it as praise for him. In the Roaring Twenties, college football grew up. The country went sports crazy as thousands of athletes returned home from the war. Newt Rockney's great Notre Dame teams dominated the early Twenties, and even Southern football gained a ripple of respect thanks to a tiny college in Danville, Kentucky. In 1921, the Center College Praying Colonel shocked the football world by defeating a Harvard team that hadn't lost in three years. 
Alabama had done little to distinguish itself in the huge 22-team Southern Conference. In three decades of football, it had never won a conference title. Yet President Denny continued to pour what resources he could into his team. In 1919, he hired Zen Scott, who played collegiate ball in Cleveland and had taken up a new profession. Zen Scott, believe it or not, was a sports writer. So when people tell me, well, sports writers don't know anything about coaching, I say, well, the guy who got Alabama's first big intersectional victory was a sports writer. He, was a, he, wrote, he covered horse racing for the Cleveland Papers. Scott was an easygoing, brainy coach, and the players loved him. His first two teams won 18 games and lost only two. But he is most remembered for a single game in 1922 when Alabama went north. At Franklin Field in Philadelphia, the team called the Crimson Tide shocked heavily favored Pennsylvania 9 to 7. But Zen Scott had been ill much of the season. Alabama's first great coach would soon die of cancer. To replace Scott, President Denny confidently pursued the best coach in the South, Vanderbilt's Dan McGugan, whose teams had won 13 Southern championships. He declined the offer, suggesting instead his assistant, a 30-year-old Tennessean named Wallace Wade. Alabama moved fast and offered Wade the job, but there was a problem. He was being courted by Kentucky. He had practically decided to take the Kentucky job and was waiting in the outer office while the Kentucky Athletic Council haggled over his terms. Wade didn't like haggling. After an hour, he burst in on the meeting and announced he was going to Alabama. And, he added, I guarantee Kentucky will never beat a football team of mine. Time Magazine. He didn't put up with any shenanigans from uh, his players or students or, I hesitate to say faculty, but certainly some of the, some of the townspeople. And uh, uh, believe it or not, as you know, he was, he was called Bear <laughs> for some 10 years before Brian even uh, made the scene down there. Wallace Wade was a shock to Alabama's players. He loved intense, grueling practices. He was crusty, blunt, stubborn, and a perfectionist. He told his players during the season they must focus on football and football only. If he came out of class, walking across campus, and there's four or five co-eds walking there by you, you didn't even know them. But the old man was coming down the avenue in his car, which everybody knew of Chrysler, and uh, you saw it coming, and you just crossed the street. He didn't want to think he was associated. No, he didn't believe in dates. But they were scared to death. The football players were scared. Of many times we've been out together, and he would come up to us and tell Bruce it was time to go home. They looked on him as, as an old grizzly bear in, in his rough ways. Wade insisted on teaching his team's football from the ground up and developed some of the best tacklers and blockers in the South. He drilled his men in every play down to the slightest movement of hand or foot, using a metronome to ensure proper timing. Of course, he was a fine gentleman, knew his football, expected you to carry out your duty and do it well. If you didn't, you didn't stay there long. Wade took over every aspect of the team and didn't appreciate interference from anyone, including his boss. Denny often said if he ever decided to quit his job as university president, he wanted to be a coach. He regularly attended practices on the field named in his honor. Went out to practice every day, and, and as I remember him, he always had his coat over his shoulder, and they, they had a story during those days, if he didn't get knocked down on the sidelines of practice, we don't win the game, and he got knocked. Practically every time he'd come out there, he gets too close to the sideline, and when they scrimmage him, Somebody hit him and knocked him down. Wade and Denny developed a public relationship of peaceful coexistence, but wrangled privately about everything related to Alabama football. Well, he used to want a coach, and Wade used to tell him that he ought to be up in the stands. They were quite a pair. 
Wade's staff included assistant Russ Cohen and line coach Hank Crisp, who would remain a fixture in Alabama athletics for 40 years. Coach Hank, uh, on one, one arm, uh, had a stump. He'd, he'd lost a hand in an agricultural accident. But one thing he did, uh, I guess you could say he was an architect of one of some of Alabama's great offensive lines, and one thing that he did to make certain of that is the fact that he would get a player down at a lineman in the three-point stance, and he'd have him, and he was he, he he would stand, he would squat down right behind him and put that stump right between his legs from his back, and when the he would say the snap count is going to be three, and he'd say, signals one, two, three, and so when he said three, that stump came up, and if if the guy hadn't gotten the proper charge, then he was. Let's just say that he had a memorable uh, soreness for a long time at a key spot. <laughs> In 1923, Wade's first season, his team won seven games, lost two, and tied one. The most surprising game was the scoreless tie against mighty Georgia Tech. A year later, in 1924, Wade's team ripped through its first four opponents then became the first Southern team to beat Georgia Tech in five seasons. The torch had been passed. The Tide was on the brink of their best season in history. But against that pesky team from Tiny Center College, they played badly and lost 17 to nothing. At 8-1, the Crimson Tide took home the Southern Conference Championship for the first time, while the national press swooned over Rockney's Notre Dame, which won the mythical national championship. Many times Bruce would go into a game bareheaded, which was just a really scary looking thing. But if you could have seen the helmets back in those days, it was just like you could take them and crush them in your hands, just like a piece of leather. And I didn't like it, but I didn't much I could do about it. <laughs> Those were tough guys. You see their pictures, and uh, they were just uh, from small southern towns in the early 20s, and it was hard scrabble cotton country trying to make, uh, you know, 25 cents a day doing whatever you could. And uh, I know Dad told me about uh, they had a big tackle named Buckler, he said was really a fine player, and a, and a guy whose, whose nickname was Cupid Perry. And if, uh, if you see his picture, you can't figure how in the world he got the name Cupid out of all that because he's a tough little guy. So mo most they, they shorten that nickname to Cube. Tuscaloosa absolutely refuses to bespeak any boy on the campus by his regular cognomen. It is prolific with and loyal to its affectionate appellations. Alabama has Lovely Barnes, Cube Perry, Sherlock Holmes, and the usual bumper crop of Reds and Hots and, of course, one Pooley, Ed Danforth, Atlanta, Georgia. In 1901, Allison Thomas Stanislaus Hubert was born to a devout Catholic family in Meridian, Mississippi. At a very young age, he was more than pleased to pick up the nickname Pooley. At 16, he talked his mother into letting him drop out of school and join the Navy to fight in World War I. He served on a destroyer and at war's end entered the Missouri Military Academy to complete high school. He starred in three sports, and his reputation for toughness landed an invitation to play at Princeton University, the school that helped invent modern American football. He lasted two weeks. As Hubert rode a train back south, he started a letter to his mother. He wrote her a two or three page letter saying how sorry he was that he was disappointing her and he hoped he wouldn't be disappointed but that uh, the boys at uh, Princeton weren't very friendly, uh, all Yankees, and uh, the professors he felt like were all atheists and he wasn't going to stay there. Hubert rode the rails through the south searching for a team, but the season had already begun. His last stop was Tuscaloosa. He spent the fall working out with the scrub teams. One year later, a 21-year-old freshman started taking command of Alabama's football fortunes. He looked and acted even older. His teammates called him Papa Pooley. 
There's no quarterback in football history that ran a team with more authority than Pooley Hubert did. When you got in the huddle with Pooley Hubert, he told you what you're going to do, and if you didn't do it right, I'm going to put somebody else in your spot. While Hubert was the epitome of the gritty, hard-nosed player, Johnny Mac Brown made the game look easy. He was the speedster, the game-breaker. Brown grew up one of nine children in a close-knit family in Dothan, Alabama. Johnny and his five brothers would pound nails in some of the shoes his father sold for a living and play tackle football in neighborhood fields. Although a deceptive runner and dangerous receiver, Brown played little his first two years at Alabama. Aside from being a poor tackler, he had a terrible memory. The players called him Dum Dum because he had a hard time remembering the football plays. Coach Wade, in fact, had to install a huddle system for Johnny's benefit. Champ Pickens. By 1924, Alabama was huddling up and Brown was running wild scoring 12 touchdowns. Grant Gillis, who played quarter and halfback alongside Brown, recalled his running style. I could tell you some tales about him you wouldn't even believe. I have seen him run down that sideline and boys coming straight up the sideline would dive at him and wouldn't even touch him. His body, his whole body would be out of the sideline, over the sideline, his feet inside, if you can believe that now. Uh, he had an absolutely glorious smile. It was a transforming smile. Apparently drama was was something that engaged a lot of his time. One of his teammates uh, uh, tells an anecdote about his standing in front of the mirror and combing his combing his hair back and, and, and talking about how, how much fun it was going to be to be a, a big Hollywood star someday. At nearly every major college across the country, football was a sport for white players only. Still, there were a few exceptions. Northern teams like Dartmouth, Northwestern, and Rutgers often featured talented African Americans at key positions. So as you get African American athletes on teams, a lot of Southern teams don't know what to do. They don't know whether to play them or not to play them. Curiously enough, some did. Some refused. It was even more of a problem when the Northern teams came South and the rule of thumb was, if you come south, don't bring your black players. Back in 1915, a Chicago-born African-American running back named Fritz Pollard led Brown University to the Rose Bowl and became the first man of his race named to the All-American team. Blocking for Pollard at right guard was a feisty southerner known at Brown as Wally Wade. In 24 years as a southern head coach, Wallace Wade would never, could never recruit a black player. But he and Fritz Pollard became close friends. Wade believed Pollard was the greatest running back he'd ever seen. But that was before the 1925 season. In 1925, Charlie Chaplin was in his prime. Walter Chrysler started making automobiles and F. Scott Fitzgerald published The Great Gatsby. In the rural South, Chaplin's culinary expertise may have been appreciated. The Roaring Twenties blew by, and agricultural depression lingered, affecting most of the region. Hostilities between the North and South were heightened during the summer by a case known as the Monkey Trial. In which a young biology teacher was brought into court for teaching the Darwinian theory of evolution. The whole thing was really um, created to garner publicity as much as anything else. And urban middle class southerners especially were horrified at the negative publicity that was generated from the Scopes trial. H.L. Mencken at uh, the Baltimore Sun is writing very critical and satiric editorials about the brain cavity size of a typical southerner and it's not at all uplifting or complimentary to southerners. So 1925 is just a terrible year. It's the peak year for the Ku Klux Klan in the South. It's membership peak, 1925. It is the year of the Scopes trial. And all of those things sort of coincide in order to create an attitude in the state that we're under siege. Everybody is making fun of us. 
when college boys by the tens of thousands start kicking like chlorines and exercising like desperate matrons, it's a sure sign that football has once more cast its spell upon the land. By 1925, going to a football game was the thing to do on a Saturday afternoon in the fall. A traditional southern football ritual caught the eye of many a northern opponent. Female team sponsors were chosen to play the role of the medieval damsel at a tournament joust, encouraging their young warriors to emerge victorious in their honor. Whether playing for the honor of their girlfriends or to placate a fiery coach, Alabama players were confident as the 1925 season began. Alabama trounced their first four opponents to quickly prove they were the team to beat in the Southern Conference. Then came the game with their most heated rival, that team again from Atlanta, Georgia Tech. At Grant Field, 20,000 fans braved the wind and rain as quarterback Hubert had difficulty developing an offensive attack. On defense, linebacker Hubert made sure Georgia Tech had similar problems. Helmetless, his durable being exposed to all the winds and tornadoes that blew and all the buffets of fortune, Sir Hubert roamed up and down that line, and whenever it cracked, and it cracked plenty, Sir Hubert took the full shock of the charge and absorbed it and the tech runner at the same time. O.B. Keeler, Atlanta Georgian. Alabama broke open the game on a single play. In the third quarter, Johnny Mac Brown gathered in a punt and spreaded toward the sideline. Three Yellow Jacket tacklers closed in on Brown as he reached the sideline, but Red Barnes followed close behind. He flung himself at the speeding trio, and every one of them came to the earth. It seemed a giant mowing machine was operating on would-be tech tacklers. Howard Pill, Birmingham Age Herald. After 55 yards, Brown reached the goal line, looked back, and saw his teammates had knocked down every single Georgia Tech player and the referee. When the final gun sounded, Alabama won seven to nothing. The statistician checked his addition and found that Pooley Hubert had made 23 tackles. Alabama remained unbeaten, but the players were beat up. Several reserves played the following week as Alabama squeezed by Mississippi A&M in a sea of mud at Denny Field. A Hubert pass to a junior end he had nicknamed Wu provided the six nothing margin of victory. Pooley was a pretty good passer, but I was a good receiver. <laughs> and beat Mississippi State six to nothing. That's all we beat them. The first team was rested, and on a fast field, they knocked off Kentucky 31 to nothing, then Florida 34 to nothing. One game remained to secure the best season in Alabama football history. In front of the largest crowd ever to see a football game in Alabama, the Crimson Tide faced the Georgia Bulldogs at Rickwood Field in Birmingham. The state's governors presided over the pregame flip of the coin, and people jammed into their seats dressed to the nines for the historic game. Georgia was expected to be a challenge, and Wade was concerned. He asked Coach Hank Crisp to give the team a little pep talk. On the field, Crispy huddled the players directing his first barb at Montgomery native Ben Hudson and his last at Pooley Hubert. He said, Hudson, we're going to start you at right end. The people in Montgomery think you, think you yellow as hell. We don't know. We're going to give you another chance. Winston, we're going to start you at left end. We've been keeping you around here a long time, and you had not done worth a damn yet. We're going to give you another chance. And it went around pointing out each man called his name and saying something about it. And at the last, he dropped his voice down very softly and said, Pooley, your old mother is taking you sick in bed and really expecting to hear you do well. Pooley started crying, and Coach Chris said, let's go. An inspired Pooley Hubert ran for three touchdowns, and the tie defense completely shut down Georgia. Three broken noses later, Alabama won 27 to nothing. For the first time in 31 seasons of football, the Crimson Tide was unbeaten. 
For the second year in a row, Alabama was crowned champion of the Southern Conference. Pooley Hubert was named the South's most valuable player. And a small handful of true believers dreamed of one more game on New Year's Day in Pasadena. Since 1916, the Rose Bowl in Pasadena had been the only postseason collegiate bowl game in the country, traditionally matching the best of the West with a top Eastern team. A Southern team had never been seriously considered by the bowl committee. In 1925, the South had a clear-cut candidate in dominating, unbeaten Alabama. Still, a bowl representative said he'd never heard of Alabama's team and couldn't take a chance mixing a lemon with a rose. And to show you how, how they regarded Southern football, Alabama was undefeated and it allowed only seven points all year. And you never guess who scored that seven, by the way, Birmingham Southern. But um, the Rose Bowl didn't particularly want Alabama. Alabama wasn't the first choice, even with a record like that. Collegiate football's popularity in the 1920s created a furious backlash in the academic community. An association of professors said football promoted drinking, dishonesty, and neglect of academic work. These and other concerns led Dartmouth, Yale, and Illinois to drop out of consideration for the bid. The bowl committee flirted with an unbeaten Tulane team, but finally offered an invitation to the Crimson Tide. Dr. Mike Denny said if there was a, a buck or two to be made, uh, you bet your life Alabama would, would head west. A fellow like me from Horseshoe Bend would never dream of it. And, and so it's the same way with all the rest of us. We never even dreamed of it until just that little short time. And then we got to concentrating on it pretty well. Across the country, Washington head coach Enoch Bagshaw did not want to play in Pasadena, despite having the best team in the West. The Huskies had a long-standing feud with Southern California. But after Alabama agreed to play, Washington was pressured by the Pacific Conference and reconsidered. After all, writers were telling Bagshaw the game would be a breeze. Braven Dyer, who was the sports editor of the Los Angeles Times and one of the leading lights of sports writing, uh, and he called Alabama uh, swamp students. He said, uh, they, they, they got no business coming out here playing these teams. They're not good enough. And, and uh, he just really gave them heck. A wise-cracking cowboy philosopher named Will Rogers summed up the general regard for Alabama's chances, calling Bama a team from Tuscaloosa. In those days, Alabama, or the Southern teams, weren't noted as, uh, as great football potentials. But it seems they thought perhaps that we were <laughs> lazy and full of hookworms or something of that sort. But nevertheless, after winning a couple of conference championships back in the South, we were invited out to play against the University of Washington, which at that time was one of the greatest football teams in, in America. I never saw an aggregation of football men quite so good. The team averages 190 pounds and every man stands over six feet. I personally think the Washington outfit could beat anyone in the country anytime. Hal Schulte, head coach, Nebraska. As the players loaded into the great southern train for the nearly 3,000 mile trip from Tuscaloosa to Pasadena, President Denny encouraged them to spend a great portion of the journey studying their classwork. Wade encouraged them to study the Washington Huskies. He wasn't fiery. He wasn't eloquent. He was, he was kind of kind of quiet, taciturn, but very much the disciplinarian, very businesslike, and very good at keeping his team focused. He even went so far as to bring 55-gallon drums full of water from Alabama in order to, uh, you know, cover every base to make sure that um, um, that nobody was going to catch any diseases from water that they would drink along the way. 
While they sipped Alabama water, the team focused on one Washington player in particular. All-American George Wilson's running and bullet passing had led Washington to score more points than any team in the country. He was tough, heavy, weighed over 200, very fast, and mean as hell. And he looked like a bale of cotton. The train ride took four days and nights, and aside from the numerous chalk talks, poker games, and eating frenzies, the trip was punctuated by little six-year-old Wallace Wade Jr. screaming out the window at every jerkwater station. Rah, rah, pooly, pooly, go Alabama! The team arrived Christmas Eve morning and settled in at the Huntington Hotel. Although tired, they hammed it up for Rose Bowl photography. The Alabamians were the toast of the town, taken to dinner by transplanted Southerners, and hobnobbing with the stars at Hollywood movie studios. And White said, enough is enough. You know, we're not going to have any more of these distractions. We're not going to do any more sightseeing trips. And I'm not going to let these Southerners sit around and subtly, unintentionally, perhaps, put any more pressure on my boys than they already have on them. So he closeted, closeted them up in the the Huntington Hotel and uh, held closed practice sessions, put them through some very, very hard practices. By the time they get there, they're not just the University of Alabama football team. They are the South's football team. And they're actually, in my opinion, sort of reliving the sectionalism of a hundred years of competition between North and South. As game day approached, one writer picked Washington to win by 51 points. Another said the Huskies, also known as the Purple Tornado, would blow the Crimson Tide back across the continent as a pale pink stream. But Alabama's die-hard promoter, Champ Pickens, chomped on his cigar and boldly told anyone who would listen, the South would rise again. So Champ was out there in uh, California for that Rose Bowl game. And he wired all the presidents of the civic clubs in Tuscaloosa and told them to send telegrams out to the Alabama players that the honor of the Confederacy was on their shoulders. They had to avenge losing the Civil War by beating these, these Washington Yankees. So uh, the Alabama players, some of them, as they ran out on the field, you know, we'll destroy those damn Yankees, you know. And, of course, the... The ancestors of the people from Washington, they had been fighting Indians during the Civil War. They weren't even in the Civil War. And Champ knew that, but he was counting on the players not knowing it, and they didn't know it. Everyone says you don't have a chance. So you say, well, heck no, we don't have any chance. What's the point of us even going out there? But we're going anyway just to try to give as good an account of ourselves as we possibly can, when what you're really thinking is this is just like Chancellorsville. This is just like Gettysburg. Now we've got one more chance for Southerners to show them what we're made of. By the early afternoon of January 1st, 1926, the Rose Bowl parking lot overflowed with Model Ts. The stadium was filled near capacity. During pre-game, the tension showed on Denny and the Alabama team sponsors, while the Crimson Tide spent part of the warm-up pointing out the one man who could ruin the day, George Wilson. Back in the South, fans were settling in to enjoy the game the only way technology could provide it. Any place that was big enough to hold 100 people and they could string up a, a telegraph wire, people gathered. In Montgomery, the advertiser rented out the Grand Theater, which was you know, the finest theater in downtown Montgomery, for one of these matinees. They strung up a special telegraph wire from the advertiser offices. And the play-by-play -play was, you know, flashed in over the Associated Press wire. On the stage, they had, looked like just like a football field. And the uh, announcer would get the play, play-by-play -play on ticker tape, I guess you'd call it, and, he, and if, he'd hold the back phone up and he'd, to his mouth, and he'd have the ticker tape thing going. And then he'd roll and he'd move like we'd gained five yards or we'd lost two yards or whatever. He'd move it, everything on the, on the uh, screen 
that he had up there, and that made us feel like we were kind of firing the game. Fred Sington was a big, fast sports star at Birmingham's Phillips High School in 1925. If there was any doubt where Sington might end up playing collegiate ball, it was put to rest that day at the Birmingham Auditorium, where a young sports writer named Bull Connor announced the game. And of course, it all came over ticker tape, Western Union, and then he picked it up and uh, built it into a drama, and he was very colorful, very loud, very expressive. As details of the game started flashing over telegraph lines, confidence in the Crimson Tide began to wane. Wilson intercepts an Alabama pass, and the Huskies march 85 yards for an easy touchdown. Alabama's offense has stopped cold, and Washington is driving again. Wilson rolls to the right, tossing a 20-yard pass for another score. The only bright spot, the point after both touchdowns, is missed. Now Alabama fell behind. 12 to nothing. So the Washington fans were politely applauding what little things Alabama did, thinking, well, yeah, it's like we heard it was about Southern football, but we'll be nice to them anyway. Well, I don't guess they've ever seen 58,000 people totally in their lives up to them, coming from little towns like they did. And so Washington took the ball and just, as I said, poorly made every tackle. And said, finally, he got up, pulled his helmet around and said, Mr. Ref, time out. Give me a time out here. And Pooley walked over and looked down and said, now just what the hell's going on around here? And for that, he said, uh, Johnny Mac kind of revivified him and, and they got back in the ball game. Late in the second quarter, this play may have started a series of events that helped decide the game. Mac Brown was tackled and his leg twisted violently by Husky star George Wilson. Two acts of aggression no sane man, however zealous, should attempt. One is to twist a mule's tail, and the other is to get rough with a southern gentleman. Jack James, L.A. Evening Express. Soon after, Wilson was knocked out attempting to tackle Bama's Winslet. Once revived, he stayed in the game, but a few plays later, Wilson was laid out again by Hubert and company. Wilson's rough handling of Mac Brown so aroused the Crimsons that they made him pay for it and forced him to the sidelines with a hip injury. It was a critical moment in the game. Zip Newman, Birmingham News. Wilson was out and Alabama was driving. The time ran out in the half with the score still 12 to nothing Washington. In gathering places across the South, the clickety-clack of the teletype was silent. Fans milled about, tense and disappointed. So the fans on Dexter Avenue and those in the Grand Theater walk out at halftime. Washington has this 12-0 lead. It does not look good for Alabama. And they walk up to Rosemont Gardens florists, and they see this giant horseshoe-shaped floral arrangements. The Alabama team photograph inside this, this arrangement of roses of crimson. And you can just imagine that they would kind of pause and look at it wistfully and kind of wonder what might have been. And they had us uh, 12 to nothing at the half. And uh, we were dejected country boys, went in the clubhouse, and Wade came in late after everybody else was in there sitting down, and he opened the door and looked in and uh, said, uh, and they told me boys from the South would fight. And he walked out, and that's all he said. Meanwhile, the Pasadena Elks band treated the Rose Bowl crowd to a rousing halftime show, playing Southern favorites. And Johnny Mac Brown left the clubhouse to relax. He has his shoes off. Uh, he obviously has his helmet off. Uh, he's smiling very broadly. He seems to be having a very good time. And you imagine, well, he's relaxing on the bench. He's and you suddenly look to one side and to the other, and you see that these are both very beautiful 1920s flapper-style women. You suddenly realize that he's sitting up there in the crowd. 
<laughs> and that he is that he is mingling with the spectators uh, and that he is preparing to play the second half. I think Coach Wade had told Pooley not to do much running himself in the first half because he figured they'd kill it. In the second half, Hubert and Alabama had nothing to lose. And the third quarter began with the Huskies' Wilson still recuperating on the bench. And Hubert smashing the line. Hubert drove through the guard, knocked the linebacker out of his way, and with two Husky backs clinging to him, drove 27 yards on his first run. Four more times, a determined Hubert bucked into the line until number 10 had plunged across the goal, and Alabama had a touchdown and a prayer. The Bill Buckler point after made it 12 to 7, Washington. The tide stopped the Huskies cold on the next series, and then Grant Gillis threw his only pass of the game. It traveled more than 50 yards. Mac Brown caught it in full stride and galloped in for the go-ahead touchdown. Buckler kicked it through again. 14-12, Alabama. The California crowd was now solidly behind the underdog Crimson Tide. A flustered Washington fumbled the Alabama kickoff, and Hubert sensed the kill. Pooley told me to run straight upfield as fast as I could. When I reached the three-yard line, I looked back, and sure enough, the ball was coming over my shoulder. I took it in stride and went over carrying somebody. The place was really in an uproar. Johnny Mac Brown. After a missed extra point, it was 20 to 12. Alabama had scored three touchdowns in seven minutes of playing time. In the third quarter, they held the Huskies to just 17 yards of offense. But it wasn't over. In the fourth quarter, George Wilson returned and courageously led an 88-yard scoring drive. Alabama's lead was cut to 20 to 19. The tide held off Washington with a pair of interceptions. Time was running out when Wilson carried a round in. Wilson broke loose. When he broke loose, Wade said, there goes the ball game. But he didn't give Johnny Mac Brown the credit. Johnny Mac brought him down, which I was sworn one fellow couldn't do. But Johnny Mac, by himself, brought Alan Wilson, saved the ball game. And the final minutes go down, tick away, and finally the words that everyone wanted to hear, Alabama wins, flash over the wire. And the Grand Theater just turned into absolute pandemonium. And it was almost unbelievable that we had accomplished it. Dexter Avenue, the Municipal Auditorium in Birmingham, Langdon Hall in Auburn, Wild cheering, wild celebration. They, they were they were beaten. They were down. Washington's head coach was humiliated by the loss. He stormed off the field without congratulating Wade. If the South had won at Gettysburg, the reports in the newspapers would have been just like the reports from January 2nd, January 3rd, January 4th, 1926. That's the way they would have described it. It would have been the battle to end all battles. It was as if Southerners had proven something that the South had been trying to prove ever since the Civil War, that we were as good as anybody else. They'd given a level playing field and the same number of players on the playing field. We can go out there and beat anybody, even the best the country had possibly produced. Birmingham News, January 2nd, 1926. Washington ran against men toughened by Southern sons into something akin to elastic steel. Men who possessed an unconquerable, undying fighting spirit worthy of the highest traditions of the South. Mere words cannot do justice to this glorious achievement. Instead, we should announce it to the world on a 10-league canvas with brushes of comet's hair. You have stamped your character upon the lives of thousands. You have written history for Alabama, which will never be forgotten. Alabama Governor William Brandon. It not only was a win, it was a, you know, a stupendous great win, one of the most exciting games in Rose Bowl history. As the team came back through the southern route, they came back and they stopped in New Orleans and there were, say, about a thousand Tulane students and uh, New Orleanians down 
praised in the Crimson Tide. They were happy that the, the, the South was, they were hungry for any kind of a victory. And that was a big victory for the South. And then from that time on, it sounds almost like a, a movie scene. The, the train went back to Tuscaloosa and they stopped in a whole lot of little towns and people would come out and wave the red and white bunning. The train came in one afternoon, I think it was about five o'clock in the afternoon. And of course the crowd there was just enormous. Everything just became one wild <laughs> display of uh, happiness and greetings and everything. In a scene resembling the return of a Roman legion from a war of conquest, thousands turned out to welcome the team home. Burt Bank was in the crowd. I was 11 or 12 years old, and that was the greatest desire of all people, not only young people like myself at that time, to go back and see this first Rose Bowl team. They were the heroes. It was a holiday in Tuscaloosa. All schools were out. Tom Allen was 16 years old. The parade was led by the Million Dollar Band, while the team followed in student-drawn wagons called drays. About 150 of us pulled those wagons all the way to the muddy quad on campus. It was a great day. Cameras focused on Brown with a Hollywood smile and Hubert with a dented nose as they savored the moment with their teammates. They stood on the historic University Mound, atop the ruins of a dormitory destroyed by invading Union troops. As team captain Bruce Jones sought out his fiance in the crowd, a national photographer promised to snap a picture. Well, I was very shy. I backed away a little bit, but that didn't stop Bruce. He kept right on. He did kiss me and love me back to, and I was happy to see him back home. It took 14 years, but President Denny had his winner. He gladly handed out the spoils, inscribed pocket watches for every player. You can look at the 1926 Rose Bowl as the most significant event in Southern football history. What had come before was almost like a build-up, a preparation to this grand coming out party. And it was a sublime tonic for Southerners who were buffeted by a legacy of defeat, military defeat, a legacy of poverty, and a legacy of isolation from the American political and cultural mainstream. Alabama's Rose Bowl games, particularly that first one, that's the keynote, the keystone of Alabama football. That's when Alabama football stopped being a totally regional affair and became a national affair. They still sing about the Rose Bowls in uh, Alabama's fight song, Yay Alabama. There's a quotation which I, I remember. It says, football is somewhat like sex. You might overemphasize it, but you'll never make it unpopular. <laughs> In 1926, Wade and his staff had to fight off players showing up from across the region itching to play for the South's glamour team. That fall, led by Red Barnes, Red Brown, and Wu Winslet, Alabama once again went unbeaten headed west to the Rose Bowl. For the first time, a national radio audience listened to the live play-by-play -play of the game as Alabama tied a strong Stanford team. With two Rose Bowls under their belt, Alabama had firmly established respect for Southern football and a bold tradition that remains unmatched. By 1927, Wade's Tide hadn't lost in 24 straight games. Then reality set in. The competition caught up. Alabama won only five games and followed with consecutive 6-3 seasons. The fans were complaining. Some things never change. The fans were complaining, you know, oh, he can't coach anymore and all that silly stuff. He realized he had, had not been, uh, you might say, a public relations man. He, had, he, he, he knew that, but uh, 
but he, he just couldn't stand the criticism. In December 1929, Duke University sent Wade a letter asking him to recommend a suitable coach for the Blue Devils football team. For Wade, the timing seemed perfect. He had tired of Denny's meddling and the grumbling from alumni. He and Dr. Denny were well, getting along too well, and he asked me what I thought. I said, Coach, the way you feel the number one thing you need to do, that is to take the job to do. And that's what he did. It was no April Fool's joke. Duke was one of the least impressive teams in college football. But on April 1st, 1930, Wade shocked Alabama faithful by signing a contract to coach in Durham. He would be paid a salary well above his Alabama contract, $12,500, plus a share of the gate receipts. Wade still had a year left on his Alabama contract, and he promised to honor it and coach the 1930 Crimson Tide. He then recommended that Denny hire former Notre Dame quarterback Frank Thomas as Alabama's new head coach. He did. The 1930 season would be one of Alabama's best ever. All-American Fred Singdon and his teammates went unbeaten in 10 games and whipped Washington State at the Rose Bowl. It was the third national championship for a Wade team in five years. What a swan song. In 16 seasons at Duke, Wade won 110 games. Two of his teams played in the Rose Bowl. The stadium at Duke is named in his honor. And just as he vowed, in 11 tries, a Kentucky football team never did defeat a Wade coach team. In the 1950s, Wade served as commissioner of the Southern Conference. He lived to be 94 and never forgot the legacy he left at Alabama. A lot of success Alabama has enjoyed through the years is related to tradition. Prestige and that sort of thing make good boys want to play football at Alabama. They want to win championships. To my way of thinking, there is no other school, with the possible exception of Notre Dame, with such tradition. I'm pleased to have had something to do with that. Wallace Wade. It wasn't a, a happy time when Coach Wade left the University of Alabama and went to Duke. And for that reason, he, he, he probably has not been given the uh, spot in the Alabama lore that he truly deserved. He took, he took the team to the first three Rose Bowl games. They went to a total of six. 1925 team captain Bruce Jones and Pooley Hubert played pro football. But Johnny Mac Brown stayed in Tuscaloosa and signed on to assist Wallace Wade. Brown helped coach the Tide back to the Rose Bowl. This time, while in California, he took some screen tests and moved to Hollywood for good. For forcing me into this, Rand, but you're making a big mistake. By the mid-30s, Johnny Mac Brown was a cowboy movie hero. He would appear in some 200 films that spanned a career of 40 years. I remember he played a Confederate soldier in some film, and I saw it, I think maybe he got killed or something. I can still remember sitting in the old Druid Theater in Tuscaloosa crying. <laughs> Absolutely. After a pro career, Pooley Hubert coached at Southern Mississippi and Virginia Military Institute, then retired to Waynesboro, Georgia, to raise peaches. But in the 1950s, when he saw a poorly coached local high school team, he moved in and installed the old single wing. Hubert's Waynesboro High School teams won several regional titles, and he was named Coach of the Year in Georgia. After Johnny Mac Brown and Pooley Hubert parted in 1926, they rarely saw each other. Their personalities were as different as the way they played the game, yet they would always share that moment in football history. So I asked him, I said, well, how long has it been since you've seen Pooley, who I think was in, living in Virginia at the time? And Johnny got kind of a faraway look in his eye, and he said, well, he said, I guess it's been 11 or 12 years since I've seen Pooley, but, and he said, tears came, and, and tears came in his eyes, and he said, but I'll tell you this, Johnny, he, he was a Johnny, and I was a Johnny, he said, I'll tell you this, Johnny, he said, 
If he walked in that door right now, I'd go over and hug him and kiss him. He said, I love that man, and I still love him. In the autumn after the great Rose Bowl victory of 1926, an overgrown eighth grade youngster happened upon the field where the Fort Ice, Arkansas high school team was practicing. He was quickly recruited, although he had never played the game. Five years later, Paul Bear Bryant would be in Tuscaloosa, ready to play for the team that rules Southern football, the Alabama Crimson Tide. What we need to do is ask ourselves a kind of interesting philosophical question. Suppose Alabama had lost badly in 1926. Suppose they had been defeated by 40 points. Would football then have become the sort of important, defining experience for Southerners that it is going to become over the next five decades? And my answer to that is no, it would not have, because the South would have just been proved yet again to be inferior in some other dimension of life and what would have happened, I think, is the South would have found some other way to excel. It would have invested this kind of emotional energy and physical commitment to something else. There goes the ball. John Temple Graves, a Birmingham newspaper editor, looked back at the cultural impact of Alabama's early Rose Bowl appearances and wrote this in 1941. For all the last stands, all the lost causes and sacrificings in vain, the South had a heart and a tradition. But the South had a new tradition for something else. It was for survival and for victory. It had come from the football fields. It had come from those mighty afternoons in the Rose Bowl in Pasadena when Alabama's Crimson Tide had rolled a glory. The South had come by way of football to think in terms of causes won, not lost. 